Welcome to Discovering Catch and Release Whitetails. We'll take a look at a study designed to track the movements of deer. This is N4. Oh. Oh. Then we're back in the kitchen with Mary Malner for some tasty pheasant stew. Sit back and relax. It's Monday night and time for Discovering. The secret streams that flow beneath the cliffs of colored stone. Forest thick and healthy with birch and pine and oak. Surrounded by the greatest lakes this world has ever known. The black bear's awesome presence as he roams the hills and fields. Call of the timber wolf, the loon's lonesome trill. The eagle soaring high above, the trout lies deep and still. These are what I treasure, the only way I measure feelings that I have for this fine land. There is so much to discover when your longtime lover of northern Michigan. The likelihood of CWD finding its way into the Upper Peninsula increasing, the need to be prepared is more important than ever. Accurate information about deer movements will play an essential role in managing the spread of the disease and help to determine the changes that need to be made to our hunting methods and regulations. Here's a look at a deer tagging project designed to gather just such information. Decimal seven four zero for the frequency. We're good. Okay, buddy. No ear tag. Thirty point seven upper neck. Point five hind leg. 80.2. 80.2. 0975 going in the right. He is. Hey, if he's like that last one. Yeah. Front's coming off. Cobble nice. yeah. off, rope off. Roll them. Ah. Ready? Yep. Yep. Come on, buddy. Ah. Nice. Keep going. Time, Caleb. Maybe you gotta get the front of this off. Yeah. 10 12. Solid two. We make a subjective assessment of each each deer. Uh, we have two independent observers that'll estimate the uh, the body condition score, and then we average them out from there just to assess the overall condition of the deer and body fat content. Yeah. 
day. It's like a record. This project has been called the Upper Peninsula Deer Movement Study, and it's a collaborative project between Mississippi State University and the Michigan Department of Natural Resources, and it's between both the wildlife management and research section. So what we're doing today is we're capturing white-tailed deer. We're looking um, at the area right now in West Iron County. Yep. We've already been to Lake Ligibic and uh, Little Girls Point over by Ironwood, and we're trying to capture 50 deer in each of these study areas. And the purpose of the study is to better understand deer movements from summer to winter, uh, better understand exploratory movements, breeding movements, and dispersal by fawn deer as, as well as these adult deer. So what we're doing first is we're taking a look, Brad just took a look to see what we have in the trap, make sure it's not collared already. Adult doe. Adult doe. Yearling, not real big, but it's an adult. And it's not collared, so we'll take it out. So what we're bringing up right now is called a, a handling box or a squeeze box as we call it. And on one end it has a window, so we can open that window, let a little bit of light in. On the other end it has a door. We're able to pull that door up, there's a small door. That allows the opening, the deer goes in, the handling box, drop the door down, and then we're able to move that trap where we actually want to work up the deer. When we move that box, we try to get it so that it's in deeper snow when we're handling the animal. That way on release, it has good footing and it can run away well. Once it's in the box, it gives us the ability to weigh the deer as well. So the first thing we do, lift the animal up and get the weight. 102.5. 102.5. We hook up a scale and then we'll just subtract the weight of the box to get the weight of the deer. Got the butt. Yep, got the butt. So after we get the weight of the deer, then we're going to pull the deer out. We check to make sure which side the nose is on. We look for which side the rump is on. The back door will be lifted and we grab both of the hind legs and pull the deer out. Once we pull the back legs out, someone will grab the front legs and the head. And then we'll hobble the back legs together. We keep the back legs pulled straight back. That way it's the safest for the deer and for us so that they can't kick. And then we'll hobble the front legs together. And one of the things we watch for when we're hobbling is to make sure that they're tight, but not too tight so that we're careful with those legs. Once the front and back legs are hobbled, We'll bring the legs together, Perfect. just like that. Yeah. And we'll throw a third hobble around the front and back legs. Pretty calm, ain't it? Yeah. Way too calm. Once the three hobbles are on, the deer is restrained enough so we can start to do some of the measurements and some of the workup that we do. 46.5, fine foot. And the first thing we usually do is get neck Upper circumference, neck, and we do this in two four. places, right behind the skull and the base of the neck. Lower neck, 52.6. And this is to give us a better idea of neck size so that when we're fitting these collars. And we're also getting two other measurements, chest yeah. circumference and right hind foot measurements. And this gives us a better idea of different morphometric size of deer across the Upper Peninsula. And as we look at deer from the south to north UP and moving towards west UP, getting into the high snowfall zones, we see that deer are larger and weigh more. And we pull a hair sample and this hair sample will be available to use for genetic analysis and look at relatedness of deer across the western upper peninsula. We also do a body condition score so we feel along the rump and the spine and the ribs feel for fat deposits and this gives us a better understanding of how much fat these animals have on them. This lets us know how good of condition deer are in different study areas and also as the winter progresses. So we also give an uh, injection of antibiotic, we give fluorophenicol, and that's just to help with anything during the stress of the handling and stress of the capture. It's, it's a little bit more for us than it is for the deer, but it's in hopes of helping to stop any infection that the deer might have. So we're using GPS collars as well on these deer, and these GPS collars will let us track these deer for the next three to five years. They'll take two locations a day, 
in their satellite collars, so they send the information right back to our computers. We're able to track uh, some of their movements between summer and winter, dispersal, breeding movements, exploratory movements. So we're collaring all different age classes. We're collaring adult bucks, uh, buck fawns, doe fawns, and adult does as well. 0193 going in the right. We put an ear tag in each ear. 0194 going in the left. It's a small uh, aluminum ear tag and that's so that once these collars fall off after about three to five years we're still able to track these deer if they ever get harvested. Okay. From there be able to see some of their movements as well. Doubles coming off. So we take the hobbles off the front legs and then we take the hobbles off the back legs and uh, hold the back end down, pick up the front end a little bit right. and then we push yep. forward on the deer as, as it's being released. Oh. Traps we're using for this project are Stevenson box traps. And this one here, along with 13 other traps, were built by the Berriga School's shop class for a project they uh, built 14 of them for us to help out. Pretty simple design. They're a little bit uh, labor intensive just because they're so heavy, but uh, safe for the deer and safe for the handlers. Uh, they're a pretty good trap. They're tripped by a trip wire. We'll bait these things and uh, we'll put a trip wire when they enter the trap they'll set the trigger that will drop this, these two doors on them and then we'll pull them out of those traps and put them into a squeeze box to handle them. But uh, they're basically eight feet long, four feet tall, um, made of half inch womanized plywood. The deer will enter from the front, they cannot enter from the back with the wire there and when they enter for the food there's a trip wire here with 12 pound test monofilament line so that if they reach in to grab it, Five seven. Lower neck, 42.8. Legs, 41.5. The 
This is N4. Back legs clear. Yeah, the bait we're using is a shell corn and a second crop alfalfa, more for bedding than anything. A lot of these deer, if they overnight in the trap, they'll, they'll be laying down when we go to check on them in the morning. So we like to have a little bedding in there for them. Do you trust me, Johnny? I'm not arguing. So the initial impetus of the study was to better understand these deer movements coming in across the border from Wisconsin. And the concern is that CWD is moving northward in Wisconsin and maybe moving into Michigan. The reason this study got started is so that we could better understand how deer are moving before CWD gets here. So that, you know, if CWD sh does show up, um, we have the best available information to try to stop the spread of CWD or at least slow the spread of CWD. Okay, we've got these beautiful pheasant breast pieces. Winter time is a great time to dig into the freezer and pull out a gift from Mother Nature. And it's pretty hard to beat a plate full of hot pheasant stew on a cold winter day. We're going to be making a pheasant stew. And this reminds me, my dad and my brothers used to go hunting all the time and that's, this is what he would make when he came home. So it's got a little bit of a cream sauce to it. Um, you could use it as a filling for a pot pie if you wanted to and just put some biscuits on top. And it's got some peas, uh, carrots, onions, celery, all, you, all your basics. So first thing we're gonna do is kind of cut these in some mouse sized pieces here. And then we'll dredge it in a little bit of flour and salt and pepper. I'm gonna put a little bit of sage in here and a little bit of poultry seasoning, not too much, just a little bit. Fresh cracked pepper and a little bit of pink salt. And then we'll just put these in, get them coated. I've got a nice big cast iron pan, so it's gonna heat up nice and even. Get these guys in here, get them cooking. You could do this with a partridge. Um, you could do this with chicken, turkey. Okay, I don't wanna overcrowd the pan because I want them to all cook evenly. If you put too many pieces in, it'll cool down the pan and you won't get that nice crust on it. And the flour on the, on the pheasant is gonna create our gravy trying to brown them up. I'm not going to cook them all the way through. I just want to get them nice and brown. Got a nice little crust on them. Take these guys out. We'll put our next batch in. Oh, these are beautiful pieces. So I'm going to get some of my vegetables ready while this is cooking. So I'm going to do a dice up a half an onion. So we're going to use some celery. I like the flavor that that brings. Got some beautiful rainbow carrots that we're gonna cut up nice and small. Okay, so we're gonna add just a little bit more oil and then in go the vegetables. Now you could serve this over mashed potatoes, mashed cauliflower, baked sweet potato, baked potato, something like that. I think today we're gonna make some Parmesan biscuits. I'm gonna put just a few mushrooms in here. Now, as these are releasing their liquid, what they're doing is they're picking up all those little tidbits and nice little flavor bites on the bottom of the pan. A little bit of salt and a little bit of pepper. We're gonna turn this down to about a medium heat. We're gonna nestle in all of our pheasant. We're gonna add just a little bit of vegetable broth to our, our leftover flour. This will thicken up right away. Give it another little drizzle here. And we're going to let this all cook down. What I'm going to do is I'm going to cover this now and we're going to keep the heat in and it's going to create a little bit more moisture. The steam will just kind of 
recycle in there. Um, so I've got it on real low. Pan's already really nice and hot. I can barely touch it. And that'll keep all that heat in there and make a nice little gravy. And then right at the end, we're gonna touch it with a little bit of heavy cream, make a really nice cream sauce, and maybe add some frozen peas. I've got just a basic biscuit mix. You could use flour, baking soda. I'm just gonna use about a cup and a half. And I've got a little bit of Italian seasoning with a lot of garlic in here, some pepper. I'm gonna add that in there. We're gonna make some just like little mini biscuits. And then I'm just gonna add some buttermilk. We're not gonna need these and roll them out. It's just gonna be kind of a quick dough. Some fresh grated Parmesan Romano. I got these adorable little mini muffin top pans that are perfect for this size biscuit. Sometimes they puff up, so I like to go every other one. These are only gonna take about eight to 10 minutes. So we'll just pop them in there. We're getting a nice gravy on this now. We're gonna finish this with just a little bit of heavy cream. And our biscuits are almost done. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna make a butter glaze for those. So I've just got some butter melting in a pan here. And we're gonna use the rest of our seasoning that we had. So I'm gonna go take those out of the oven. We're gonna take one of our biscuits, we're just gonna kind of break it up here a little bit. And then we've got a little bit of our Parmesan just to sprinkle on top. And there you go. Well, that's it for this week. Be sure to check out 906outdoors.com where you'll find the 906 fishing report, TV6 weather, shopping, and more. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you next week right here on Upper Michigan's very own Discovering 906.